Keep going. <laughs> if we can get everybody on up here, please, as soon as we can, we'll get started. We want to hold people. So good to see you, Regina. You look so great. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. We are so thrilled to have you here for the Ribbon Cutting of the Village of Clinton. I'm going to stand for We have done this together, and it makes my heart so full that we can be together to celebrate what we have done as a community. So thank you all very, very, very much. And I'm going to hand the mic off to someone who needs no introduction, Ingrid McIntyre, our founder. What you're looking at behind us is Ingrid's vision, and Ingrid brought this to life, and it's probably the most beautiful thing I think I've ever seen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As I would say on a Sunday morning, welcome, church. <laughs> this is even better than church, right? Um, I'm a little overwhelmed right now, and so hopefully I won't cry. I'll probably cry later. Ms. Pat, thanks for being here. But I do want to say welcome to everyone that is here, and I want to say um, thank you to the believers and the non-believers both. Thank you for people who believed on the very first day. Um, my brother, thanks. My family, um, even when you thought or think I'm crazy. <laughs> I am. Um, thank you for those who are still questioning and you still came this morning. Um, this is a scary, strange thing that we're doing because it's a little bit different. But we believe that it is the story of love that needs to be shared with all people. And sometimes even in, in the places where we think that we shouldn't be is exactly where we should be. Right? Yesterday we read a scripture in church that talked about breaking down barriers and breaking down legalities that don't really mean a lot in comparison with love. But love is what the answer is. And hopefully this village will be a reflection of love in our community. Before, um, well, I just want, I'm not going to name anyone, right? Because look at all the people here. All of you have had a piece in this. Every one of you. So we start naming names, then, you know, uh, things get crazy. So we're not going to do that this morning. But um, I do just want to say thank you to every single one. And especially, I want to say, because I think this was the most risky thing. I want to say thank you to the people at 
Plaincliffe United Methodist Church. Yeah. were the bravest of the brave to say yes this is what we call risky discipleship when there are um, you know people who aren't so certain that this is the right thing to do um, but y'all prayed about it and you said this is the love thing to do and we're gonna do it and if that means that we lose some members that's okay and if that means if our name smeared a little bit that's okay but we're gonna stand up and we're gonna do this and you've done it so thank you it was the risky of the risk now I want to share a little bit just really quickly I hate to um, say anything about myself but just so that everybody knows uh, what is happening Miss Miss Pearl Miss right. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl's here the garden queen she's here um, I just want to say that um, really quickly that so I'm going to still be quarter time here at Glencliff United Methodist Church and I am now three quarter time at Belmont United Methodist Church as the um, pastor of community engagement which I said they kind of hired me to be the shitster and <laughs> then Charlie Strobel said well isn't that what you are <laughs> yes Charlie right so we gotta be doing stirring it up so that's how I'm serving in the capacity now here in this space. And then I um, want to introduce to you right now um, Rob Nash. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to share that um, I have to read these things because I don't know all the things. But for the past. 11 years, um, Rob has been serving as a nurse practitioner at Vanderbilt Comprehensive Care Clinic for people who have HIV and AIDS who maybe don't have a home. Or maybe who it's been difficult for them to find their medication or who don't have um, health insurance or who don't have a supportive um, community around them and so Rob instead of meeting with them 15 minutes every six months or so he meets with folks an hour a month to make sure they know that they're cared for right to make sure that they know that they are not alone in this fight that just because they may not have a nuclear family a family related by blood they still have a family related by love for those of you who know me, I don't like to sing blood songs in church, and so a lot of times I change love for blood, and I always say love instead. And, and, and Rob has represented love and community and family to so many people, and that is why he is here today. That is why we can say, Rob, <laughs> be our fearless leader and take us on to the next steps, right? So, Rob... Um, I just want to thank you for being willing to do this. It's a lot. Um, but as we all know, I am not a manager of humans. <laughs> I'm, I'm a shitster. <laughs> and so um, thank you for taking this um, special love task on. I love you. I love you. greatest honor and blessing I could ever imagine. And we have a great roster of speakers today. I just want to say a couple of things before we turn it over to people who are smarter than me. <laughs> but these are important things. Being forced to live without housing isn't difficult. Being forced to live without housing isn't challenging. Being forced to live without housing is brutal, traumatizing, dehumanizing, and lethal. Yeah. I've spent the last 15 years working with people traumatized and marginalized by the experience of being unhoused or having HIV or both. 
all three preventable epidemics. I know from years of working with these people that the physical, mental, and spiritual pain inflicted by trauma is real and far-reaching. I also know that there's not a pill for trauma. The only way to permanently address trauma is with the tools of time, love, and community, yes. TLC. Time to build trust, love to create self-confidence, and community to sustain trust and self-confidence. And speaking of community, look behind me and look at the marvel that you have created. Yeah. This is what community looks like. This is a place of intentional dignity, healing, love, and respect. There's an old saying, the bright road to justice is paved brick by brick. These homes are your bricks. You are the agents of change. My team and I are here to bring your vision of dignified, respectful, and loving care to life. Speaking as a clinician, I couldn't be prouder of the robust, robust set of services that will be available to our residents during their stay here, which is gonna average 90 days. First class respite care rests on a foundation of clinical care, as healing the body is fundamental to the full life that is a birthright for every last one of us. Speaking as a Nashvillian, I couldn't be prouder that individuals and groups from across the city came together and created this sacred space. Yes. Amen. This new space, unlike anything else in the country. That's right, Nashville, the healthcare capital of the United States, has just taken the lead in respite care with a model that cities across the country will soon come here and learn and take and build it. Yes. And finally, I'm almost done speaking as a human. I couldn't be prouder than I am right now to lead the village at Glencliff. This community is love in action. A place to give love, a place to receive love. A place where those who have been powerless for so long can come and heal in bounty. A plate heals all of us is truly healthy until everyone is healthy. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for being a community and giving community to our most vulnerable friends and fellow children of the Creator. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. We're very thrilled to have Bobby Watts here today. Bobby is the CEO of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. And this is one of Nashville's hidden gems. If you don't know about it, you really should. The National Healthcare for the Homeless Council is the nation's premier advocacy clearinghouse education and support organization helping all 165 respite organizations across the country to be better and give more care every day and it's right here in nashville tennessee so thank you bobby for taking the time to be with us this morning thank you it is indeed a great honor to be here and this is a great day this, I, I felt it was just so fitting when I come up and I see live music in Nashville, when I see all the smiling faces, when I saw that the cars are backed out to the road, I said, this is a great day. This is a great day for Nashville. This is also a great day for the whole country. As Rob said, there is nothing like this in any part of the country yet, and you have led the way. I just want to, um, yes, and I just want to say um, how honored and thrilled I am as the CEO of the National Health Care for the Homeless Program to be here to celebrate with you. As Rob said, he feels so blessed to be in his role. I feel exactly, exactly the same way. It, I've been in this role for about four years. 
and I've just been so thrilled with what we have seen of how Nashville has responded to COVID, how Nashville has responded uh, in new ways to meeting the needs of their neighbors without homes. But I have to say, um, as soon as I got here, I was told there are some people you need to hear about. And I heard about Reverend Ingrid, uh, and then we got to know each other, working on committees and being even on a, a, an interview together. And I got to hear about Reverend Lindsay. And I, start, I said to her, I've started reading your book. I haven't finished it yet. I'm just waiting to finish it. And what I heard was that these are people who are real. And I heard this from people who are currently or were then without homes. And that's when you know when someone is real. Not when other uh, organizations say things, great things about them, but when the people that they are here to serve said they are sincere, they are real. And I have to say, they quickly became my heroes. And I heard about the vision that they had to start this. And I heard about some of the trouble that they had and how they persevered. Uh, in my previous role, I had to work and to situate shelters. And no one wants a shelter in their neighborhood. So I started asking, I said, have they done this? Have they done that? Have they done this? All the things that work, and I heard yes. They, they were completely on it. They were completely understanding of what you need to do to be a good neighbor. So um, I just really want to thank them Cecily. and give them a round of applause for making this day possible with their vision, the oh, tenacity. So the thank table. you so much. Okay. Okay. And then I heard about United Methodist Church. I heard about a church that gave part of their land so that tiny homes can be built, so that their neighbors could have a place to be with dignity, and that they could have a safe place to heal. And I immediately said, that is a church that is putting love into action, that is showing really how to love our neighbor, of how is putting hands and feet on the good news of showing God's love and reaching out to their neighbor without homes. And I just really was so impressed and really want to thank you. And, and congratulate and thank you so much, United Methodist Church. And I will just move towards my conclusion and just say I'm just really honored with the role that the council has done in helping to develop medical respite programs around the country. And just over a little, uh, actually one year and four days ago, we said we need to really um, elevate the, the, the view of medical respite programs. And we started the National Institute for Medical Respite Care exactly a little over a year ago on July 15th, 2020. And we weren't really ready. But we saw how so many medical respite programs were pressed into action um, during the COVID pandemic as pe people without homes are getting sicker and sicker and they needed a model. And I am so glad that we did that because it raised the view of medical respite and I am thrilled that it got the attention of the CDC Foundation, yes. which gave the council some funding to give to promising medical respite programs. So we had a competitive Request for proposals. Uh, it, we, everybody had to submit proposals. Everyone had to be uh, judged and scored. And I was secretly rooting, though I couldn't do it outwardly, and I had no part in doing this, <laughs> hoping that that Nashville's program would, would be funded. So we're honored that the council could be a small part in the chain of helping to bring this this vision into action by providing some funding that will help. Now, why is this so important? Why is Nashville's program here at Glencliff so important? It's doing two things that I think could be revolutionary and game-changing for the medical respite programs around the country. One of them is that it's using a uh, tiny home. Thank you. One of them is it's using tiny homes. Um, and I think what a way to give people dignity as they are healing and, and, and having a safe place to heal. The second, and this may be a little wonkish, is they are using SOAR, 
a special program that helps to ensure that people who have disabilities can uh, be successful in their application. In my previous role, this cut down our, um, our refusal rates or our rejection rates from the first time around from about 70% to 20%. In other words, we were successful 80% of the time by knowing what to do. Now, why is this really game-changing and revolutionary and why I think others may want to do this? And I'm like, when I heard it, I said, wow, why didn't I think of that before? It is because once they get the disability, um, once they're uh, um, certified as having a disability, they get funding so that then they can get permanent housing, they get other services. So one of the hardest things about medical respite is when you are ready to leave, when they are healed, where to go. This can be a way to ensure that people have long-term permanent housing stability and also the services that they need to deal with their disability. So this is a great day for Nashville, a great day for Glencliff, a great place for the country. And because of this, many people without homes will have great days in these tiny homes as they heal, but more importantly, they will have many, many more great days in permanent housing. And it's all because of what you have all done together. Thank you for this great, great day. Thank you. So one of the deals that I have with Ingrid is that she gets to say all the fun words and I have to say the nice words because I'm the director now. So <laughs> when I introduce Odessa Kelly as a fellow troublemaker of Ingrid's, I'm not going to say what she's stirring. So somebody else gets to have that pleasure. But we are honored to have Odessa Kelly with us today, an activist who has very deep roots in the community and very deep hope for a better community for all of us together. And we're Good morning, good morning, good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Can the people behind me, can you hear me? Good morning to you as well. Hello, Mama Pearl. My name is Odessa Kelly. I am the executive director of Stand Up Nashville. Glad to be here with you this morning. Anyone who knows me, I usually don't write stuff down, but I was honored that uh, Ingrid asked me to come speak you know, this morning and over this weekend, I was really, really thinking about it. So I don't want to miss anything, but it's okay if I have a good, real conversation with everyone today. Let's go! All right, that's exactly what we're about to do. So, what well, first thing I had to think about is much too often this year, last year, I've had to show up to events, public gatherings in protest or resistance, you know, to something that is happening or something that is going on, you know. Um, it feels really good to be here today for this type of occasion, you know, so yeah. It feels good to be among people who I consider allies, <laughs> the beloved community of Nashville, our city, our communities, and I have to keep saying that because it is ours and we need to do a better job of having ownership and autonomy in what is ours. Yes. You know? Today we witness another piece of the puzzle and by that I mean us building this city, our city, our communities with our values in the way that we want to see Nashville grow. Yes. In the way that we want to see Nashville grow. Yes. And I have to keep repeating that, you know. It took, what, $270,000? Just for the field. Just for the field, to start this. $270,000 is what it took to start this, the field of the dirt. But more than that, what it took was a bunch of people, you who are here today, saying, how do we make our communities whole? How do we build communities that heal, that perform in a way, that make people, that restore people for what they need? Much too often, far too often, we have been building Nashville in a way that is punitive to those who do not have. Right. And you can Amen. fill in the rest of that. Right. 
people who don't have homes, people who don't have resources, who don't have family, that don't have money, that don't, that don't, that don't. Yet they are still part of our community. Amen. So I'm proud of this community. I'm proud of all of you to stand up and say, hey, I see you as a part of the community. And what we're going to do is that we're going to create a tool and a pathway that allows you to re-engage with the community in a healthy way. A pathway to restore you and bring you back into the fullness of what it means to show empathy, to show people that we're all here with your struggling, I'm struggling as well to help you solve that problem. This is a momentous occasion here today. I don't want us to like diminish the value of what has happened here today. I say that again, and I brought up the number of $270,000, is because I don't know if any of y'all know Tupac, but there was um, there's a good scene, if any of y'all can find it, where Tupac says we shouldn't have lottos that have $36 million when we got people living on the street. When we have people starving, people going without homes, apartments, you know, pants. <laughs> Think about that. Now I look here today where we have millions of dollars that are going into entities that don't need them. Yeah. What would happen if we were to take the state lotto and really build affordable housing to build housing in a way that we need to see it in this city? What would happen with that? Just think about it. I saw a young woman over here standing a second ago and she was crying tears of joy because she had to work real hard, real, real hard to build this. And this should just be the way that we do things. It took a church. It took a church and private citizens to build what should be automatically public policies. It should be intentional in how we build our city, and how we live in it, and how we grow in it. And we have to keep doing that. So today, I want you to remember that your job is not done here today. This is you getting charged to do the rest of the fight that we need to see happen, not only here, but across the city. So take this good energy that you have here, everyone that you have right here in this moment and let that feel a seed to grow across this uh, country all right but definitely in the city of nashville we need it this weekend i got to sit with over 30 or 40 civil rights leaders real civil rights leaders too i mean those who was back in the 60s and 70s you know you know catching the real you know trauma and brunt just because of the color of their skin we celebrated the life and the legacy of John Lewis this weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things, Dr. Uh, 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 Lawson, thank you, I appreciate that. You keep that my back, I'm tripping. Dr. Lawson, all right. One of the things he came and said this weekend is that you should not be ashamed to lead and think and work out of love. And far too often, it is the last thing that, the last option that we take, if we take it at all. Could you imagine what this city would look like if we led with that? If we had systems and tools who were measured by how they heal instead of performing, how they actually heal and restore people for what they need. 30, 40 civil rights leaders in a room this weekend I don't think they fought and shed blood to have a, a city that is displacing people because they right. do not have fill in the blank. Money, housing, resources, stable family, jobs that pay a living wage, the emotional support that they need. All the tools that we need that we come together and have as a community. And far too much, I see it to be informative where people come and show up at these type of events and then skip the things that can help us put an end date to homelessness, an end date to poverty in this city, an end date in this city, but that this grows and we start to hold everyone accountable in how we build this city to truly represent who we are. This is the best representation I've seen of what Nashville means to me in a long while. And that needs to keep growing across this city. I'm not gonna keep going because I can go all day. <laughs> But that is what Ingrid asked me to come here to do, is to remind people that this is just a little piece, a little piece. This is a reminder of who we are as a city and the ability of what we can do when we come together. So again, give yourselves a hand. Congratulations to the church, to the village, for building a piece of Nashville.
A piece of Nashville that represents who we are and fills that hole that we have in our souls. Have a good day. We're honored next to have our vice mayor here with us today, Jim Schulman. Jim has been a partner with Ingrid for a long, long time in the development of this project, and we're honored that he would take the time to be with us today. So I'm we're coming. No, no, no. We're going to trade. We're going to trade. I'll take the giant scissors. Yes, I will. There's a small child back here who is playing with Now there's two small children. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Everybody good? A nice, warm day. So I am a politician, so I have to speak longer than a business folk. So I'm going to be up here for about three or four hours. I can get some water. Oh, no. No, okay. So I do need to recognize we have a couple of council members here. Berkeley Allen is back here. And council member Jenny Welsh is back here. And then we have, a, I know we have at least one judge here, Linda, uh, Linda Jones, where did she, oh, she had to leave. Okay, well, she was here, honestly, I did see her. And David Riley is here, our former mayor. All right, so um, before I leave uh, Mr. Briley, um, I was here the, the day that they um, broke ground on this. And um, Mr. Briley, then I believe who was uh, the vice mayor, um, got up and talked about um, how important a day that was and how we needed to do much, much better. And I remember those words and here we are and we are cutting the ribbon on this great building, on these great buildings. So before I go any further, um, um, I know you may have recognized your parents. I don't know where they are. Where are your parents? There's one in the back and one in the front. They're all hiding someplace. So um, I don't know what they did um, when they were raising uh, Ingrid. Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay, listen. laughs> right, so I won't say what Ingrid said. But most of them. <laughs> Either, either we should take a, a whole chapter on how you raised her, and you should write it down and give it to us, and then we should either decide to follow it or not follow it. <laughs> Just a couple of things. Look, we made it through the pandemic. So we did it. Now, it's not over. It's not over. But we made it a long, long way. I was hoping that during the pandemic, everybody would take some time and try to realize what is important in our world. People are important. Yes. Not the money, not everything else. It's people, and it's not just a select group of people, it's everybody. Yes. We are all in this together. Isn't it the little things that matter? We really have to concentrate always on the big things. Isn't it the, the little things that matter? Shouldn't we all be working together for the same purpose? I think we should be. Can we not find common ground in making this world better? Yes. And then the last thing, even though Ingrid already is beating us to it, with all the federal money available, isn't it time that we come together and set goals and use that funding to do what's really, really important for this world. Yes. I'm hoping you all are watching this. Is, you know, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll end by saying this. So this is um, um, the 20th year since 9-11, long time ago. There was a Time Magazine article after 9-11 that talked about um, how this country came together uh, during that period of time um, and that we were better. All of us were better. I think we all decided that we could do better. 
And uh, the magazine said that for about six months, we were nicer to each other. We cared about each other. We all of a sudden started thinking about what really was important in this world, about each other. We cared for one another. It lasted six months. So I think we have to re-pledge ourselves. Uh, we just are coming out of a pandemic that should have made us all realize that we're all in this together. Um, we have to be nicer to one another. We have to work together. And we have to remember everybody. What is behind me is a tremendous effort led by Ingrid to do something that was really, really important. I remember some of those meetings that Ingrid had with the community. And um, somehow she managed to get through. She had yeah. a purpose, she had a vision, she had a goal. And she did it. Yes. And she did. That means that the rest of us can do it too. Yes. Amen. So let's go out there and make this world better. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And now our last speaker, we're honored to have one of our board members with us this morning, Ms. Valeya Tidwell, and we're gonna do this together. I say is because I say I'm recovering is I'm still learning how to live for many years spent on the streets being afraid lonely and scared and humiliated humiliated <laughs> it's a struggle each and every day I'm still learning how to to live again with the, with the help from my family and friends who believed in me who believed in me they were sharing when I needed them. Yes. Just to see how far we had came. Yes. When I was homeless, there was time I wanted to give up. During that time, I met Lindsey Creeks, who is a homeless advocate with open tapes. I remember us having a brief conversation, seeing how genuine and loving and caring she was with the homeless people. During that time, we became friends. We broke up fights together, <laughs> we laughed together, and we cried together. In the midst of all that, she was helping me get my life back together. During this time, I got hit by a drunk driver. It crushed me mentally and physically. Two broken hips, one broken leg, a broken ankle, with a broken pelvic. Then depression kicked in. Thought I was alone until they showed me difference with the help from my family and friends again. <laughs> They took the time out to visit with me. They talked with me. They kept helped me keep up with the holidays. They helped me keep my sanity. With limited rehabilitation, nowhere to go, no help. Had to beg someone to let me stay there. Or I would never made it out here on these streets. When I looked at these homes, the word gratitude comes to my mind. My, homely, my homeless community doesn't have to do this alone anymore. Yes. 
They have something to look forward to. I've been through. I am so grateful that the micro homes are finally here. Thank you. Much love, all. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to turn the program back over to Ingrid McIntyre. All right. I know. Uh oh. No. You know, I'm not. Um, my job right now is to make another ask. Because even though we've been working for lots of years, there's still a lot that needs to be done to this village. Do you see, you probably don't, but right behind us over here, there is site work that has been prepared for the next 10 homes. Also, this is my nephew Cole. <laughs> We've seen a lot of people over the past couple of days. So we need to raise some more money for the second half of the village. We have a kitchen uh, right behind Randy Morgan. Put your hand in the air. That's our general contractor, by the way. Yeah. We love him. So right behind us, there's... Um, there's a kitchen that is going in. We just took out a kitchen um, and we're putting a commercial kitchen in. We still need to raise funds for two of our salaries. So I'm not going to go into a lot of things because I think all the people behind me have said all there is to say and shared all the reasons that we need to continue to support the village. So if you can, there are envelopes here. There are people at the sign-in stations. There are QR codes, if you're fancy, like Allie Rutland, <laughs> then you will use a QR code um, to send money to the village at Glencliff so that we can continue shaping this community so that it's not only here, but so that there are people here who are trained and skilled and loving towards the community that comes in. As I see each of your faces, I wanna call so many names. <laughs> Can I just look at you for a minute? And say thank you. Oh, that's really special, you guys. We love you. Thank you. Yeah. That's not what this is for. I really do want to just see your faces for a minute. Thank you for believing. What I can say is to continue believing in people we must continue believing in each other. Every each other, right? Not just special each other's or what we think are special each other's. But each of us here today and each of us who are still out on the streets that don't have a home and that don't feel the community that we feel right here, right now in this space. So let's continue drawing the circle wider. Let's continue sharing our resources. Let's continue living just a little bit simpler, Carlson, so that other people can live. A lot of us have a little bit of extra that we can share, right? And then we need to continue sharing those things. Um, and thank you for all you have already shared. I am going to hand the mic over. Oh, and my Uncle Tony's here. He's known me for a long time. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Tony. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my good friend and colleague, the Reverend Keith Caldwell who is the pastor of the historic C. Hubbard United Methodist Church, who is a fellow freedom fighter and advocate, and he really doesn't need much of an introduction. Good morning, folks. Thank you. 
before we do the house blessing, I just want to say I'm, I'm really thankful to Ingrid. Um, we kind of operate in community in similar fashion. So she and I fight about twice a week. <laughs> Usually by Friday, if we haven't gotten our second fight in, she'll call me or, or I'll call her. So <laughs> um, will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for this manifestation of healing, yes. of housing, and of radical hospitality and community. We pray your continued blessing on the holistic success of this community pray for those who help bring this vision into reality. We thank you for bringing this vision to Ingrid, and we thank you particularly for the church members of Glencliff United Methodist Church. We thank you for Justin, for Lynn Taylor, for Michael, and many, many others who have been on the front lines of making this happen. Yes. Well, we thank you that your justice will permeate the hearts of all the decision makers that are made regarding this site of resistance. This is truly taken a village to make this happen, to make this possible. We ask for your continued blessing on this effort. This, it is through the power of love that we make this petition. We thank you for the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace that we will continue to embody throughout this endeavor. It is in the name of all that is beautiful and loving that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And I think now we're almost done with the program. Ingrid and I are going to take the giant scissors. And if you'll walk down and join us, we're going to cut the red ribbon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 